Okay, so I'm going to talk about the first year since the launch. And this was the picture you missed, that, that uh, about half of the uh, em emission created since the CMB is now in the infrared. Um, and that's what is emitting are cold black bodies. We're talking tens of Kelvin. And we, we, we're having also all sorts of spectral lines in this area. The kinds of sources we're talking about are basically infrared-dominated star-forming galaxies at basically all the red shifts where stars are forming. Um, and on top of that, it conspires that stars, forming stars, are also having SEDs that peak uh, in, in, in this range. So it all conspires to make a big peak in the infrared spectrum around 100 micron or so, 100 to 200 micron. And that's why Herschel has been built to cover exactly that peak and to be able to measure on both sides of it to get the physics. Now, the machine looks like this. It has a, the biggest telescope we could fit, which is a three and a half meter Cassegrain. Um, what we're doing, building on, on the previous missions, is that we're catching on to their long wavelengths and then pushing that into the submillimeter until we come to the wavelengths where we make contact with the ground, as it were. So we're plugging the hole between the previous missions and what we can do from the ground now and in the future. Now, this spectral window may not be completely new, but at least it's very poorly observed compared to uh, the other windows we have. In order to do this, we need not only a big telescope, we also need very capable and, and powerful instruments. We have three instruments on board Herschel, two cameras and imaging spectrometers called PAX and SPIRE, and we have a heterodyne spectrometer called HiFi. Um, the objectives, as you can imagine, having seen my previous view graphs in the end, um, have to do with star formation, both near in our own galaxy and far away across cosmic time. Um, we're talking physics and chemistry of the interstellar medium, and we're also talking objects in our own solar system, in particular, uh, trans-Newtonian objects and, and, and uh, atmospheres and comets. And what, you, what Herschel will provide you with is a unique perspective on these things um, and for, for, uh, for three years. Now, if this works, I have a little movie that shows you what Herschel looks like, the inside that you can't see. So we have an optical bench with three focal plane units on it, and that optical bench This is slower than usual. <laughs> Sits on top of a big tank of superfluid helium. Uh, uh, it, about 335 kilos of it at launch. Um, and the instruments have contact with the fluid. And the fluid that boils off, the gas we take and cool the instruments further. We encase everything in the Rus Russian doll system with three vapor-cooled shields around the tank itself. And outside the vapor cold shields, we have a vacuum vessel. And on top of the vacuum vessel, we put our telescope. And below, we have the service module. And there's lots of harness and stuff and shields. And in the end, we protect everything with the sunshade, which also serves as our solar batteries. And voila. This is the spacecraft. And uh, to put some dimensions, it's about seven meters tall, about four meters across. And at launch, it had a mass of about 3,400 kilos. In the session after lunch, there will be specific dedicated talks about the instruments. So I will not say very much more about them here. Now, this is one of the last pictures we have of Herschel just before, this is now sitting on top of the rocket, just before we put on the fairing, which is coming down here. Herschel is sitting on top of this black uh, uh, casing, which has another satellite plank inside. And this is the, uh, this is the fairing coming down. This is, this is what it looks like when it's rolled out. This is one day before the launch. And this is the view you have from the viewing location where we were watching the launch. And you have a number of people here trying to look extremely calm and composed. This is about half an hour before the launch. 
And uh, the people on the left here in the picture are the three, uh, at the time, Herschel uh, PIs. And uh, on the right, you have a couple of Planck people and a guy from headquarters. Um, this is actually a movie on the launch, but given the speed of the other movie, I don't think we should try to watch it. But I can assure you that the rocket did what it was supposed to do and did it very well. The launch was, was textbook and with great precision. And the plan then after the launch, basically, you see on this view graph here, to uh, do the commissioning phase in two months. It takes actually two months for the spacecraft to thermalize after the launch because we are launching a warm spacecraft with a cold cryostat inside. And it takes two months for everything to thermalize. And in, during that time, we were go, doing the commissioning phase. And then we had planned to do a, a, a performance verification phase of about three months after that. Then science demonstration phase, taking small snippets of our various observing programs do the observations and ensure ourselves that what we get is what we want. Otherwise, we need to update and optimize. And then, when everything is hunky-dory, we just go and execute and run the uh, programs that we have. So that was the plan, and that's a very good plan. Now, one month after the launch was the next launch, as it were, opening of the cryo cover. No cryo cover opening, no mission. Um, and so the cryo cover was, was opened by a ground command, and uh, in Darmstadt, in the Mission Operations Center, you could see in real time what was going on. And what you see on the screen here is the reaction of the three-ton spacecraft to a 700-gram lid opening. So it was clear right away that, uh, that the lid had opened, and we could actually count the number of times it was swinging back and forth before it stopped, seven times. So the, so the cryocover opening took place on a Sunday. This is Monday evening. That they, and, and, and you should know that Herschel operates in an autonomous mode, so we only talk to the spacecraft three hours a day. So after the cryo cover opening, we were 21 hours operating autonomously. Then the next day, the data was, 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 was uh, transmitted to the Earth in the afternoon, and this is in the evening. And you can see the first Herschel images are still under embargo in this picture here. Um, and... Uh, but this is what it looked like. The very first image taken by Herschel on the Spiral Galaxy M51. And we did this because we needed to uh, find out all sorts of things in terms of pointing and, and optics and so on. And the most interesting and, and crucial one was the optics of Herschel. So what we did, we needed the yardsticks. We took the best one which is available, namely the Spitzer. Spitzer has perfect optical performance. Um, so, by, by, by comparing Spitzer images with the Herschel images, you can say something about the quality of the Herschel images. Now, sh showing 160 to 160 doesn't help you so much, except to conclude that we must be doing something right. Um, but if you, if you choose a 24 micron image from Spitzer with a 100 micron image uh, with Herschel, you have a factor of 4. And that's approximately also the ratio between the aperture sizes. So if we neglect astronomy uh, for, for the time being, saying that the, the, the source looks the same at both wavelengths, then the pictures ought to look approximately the same. Um, if they do, it means Herschel is diffraction limited. Now, it is. So this was an enormous, enormous uh, feeling which we had that Monday evening. Um, and it gets even better because 100 micron is a relatively short, but not the shortest wavelength for Herschel. At 70 micron, it's even better. So we could conclude just there and then, although in qualitative terms, that Herschel optics is fine. We are diffraction limited. Now, what's the big deal? Well, we couldn't test that before we launched. And you saw in the picture, in the little movie that I showed you, everything is, 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 is um, assembled warm. You, you make a cryostat. You, 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 you build a cryostat with the instruments inside, you cool it down, you put the warm telescope on top, the cryostat is closed, you, you, you don't have an immediate access to the inside of the cryostat from the outside. You screw the telescope onto the warm cryostat, the warm telescope, you, you, you go through the entire test phase, you send it up in space, everything cools down, and when you open the lid, everything is in the right place. This is what we had to do, and this is what we took every precaution 
that we would do, and that's what we did. And this is the confirmation. So that was the significance of the first images of Herschel. So this is kind of the, the, uh, um, the three things that we needed to do. We needed to launch, we needed to open, and we needed to verify optical performance. And there we are. We now, in principle, have an observatory that we can start working with. And now we also have the numbers, and you can, you, you can go into great detail, and this is thanks to work done in the PAX consortium, uh, because they are working at the shortest wavelengths. So we now have all the numbers for the PSF and for the encircled energy and what have you, and we are fulfilling all the specifications that, that we had. So we're happy about that now. So PAX works, now the other instruments. So uh, just after, one or two weeks after, we had Spire first light. And Spire observations um, we did on, on a couple of nearby galaxies. And you see them here, M66, M74. Uh, what is annoying, of course, is all this noise in the background. But it's not noise. It's the high redshift universe. You get it for free when you, when, when you image a nearby galaxy. The specks that you see in the background are galaxies. They're not noise. Third instrument, the heterodyne spectrometer, IFI. First spectra, and uh, C plus, water, CO, in a star forming uh, region, DR21. So we have now have three instruments up and running, um, and, and we're in the performance verification phase. Unfortunately, very shortly after this, these observations were made, there was an anomaly with the HiFi instrument on the 2nd of August last year. Um, and it was out of action until mid-January. So what we had to do was to replan, adapt, and, and, and work more with, with the remaining two instruments. And what actually happened, a little bit to our surprise at the time, if I remember right, was that the scanning mode was the first observing mode that we released for real use. And this is one of the first tests that you see here of uh, large area mapping using a scanning telescope, just scanning back and forth like this. It turned out to be the simplest observing mode we have, and it created also these wonderful images that immediately uh, kind of placed Herschel in people's mind that it's something that exists. And this is a, this is a part of the galactic plane. It's about three, three degrees across, and we, we make an observation like this in a few hours. Now, here, is in January, and it's confirmed that the right command has been set, sent up to reboot the HiFi instrument, which has been in, in, in use ever since. And here's one of the first observations made with HiFi uh, after the uh, reboot in January. So, taking stock one year after launch, basically, at that point, we have a working observatory. Uh, we launched and we did, uh, we did the initial phases. We had a workshop just before Christmas where we shared the initial results between us. Um, and we had a big workshop in May, which was the real first science meeting uh, with Herschel. Um, and we were more than 400 people in Nordvik, and there were 99 oral presentations and more than 100 posters. All the presentations and most of the posters you find on the Herschel Science Center website. Um, we also have ANA special issues. One is coming uh, very soon. There will be 153 or possibly 152 papers in this issue. And there will be another issue in a couple of months' time with, uh, with HiFi papers, only another 53 papers or so. So it's coming. Now, what I want to do now is just to give a couple of examples of the kind of things that people have written up for, for ANA based on most of the time observations done during the science demonstration phase typically October, November, December, January, this kind of time frame. So what you see is based on the very first Herschel observations done for science. Now, one of the things, of course, which I mentioned is star formation, star formation, star formation. And one of the big programs is a survey of, of, of the gold belt um, and, and several, star, several nearby star forming regions. And I'm going to show some images from two of them, two extremes, Polaris, and, oops, okay, Polaris and another one. Now, this image I don't like, but what I will show you are these images. 